So good evening, everybody. I think everyone who is expected to be here is here. Um, it's seven o'clock and it's a Thursday evening, so it is the RDA webinar. Um, this is the first webinar that we're having after our Road to Restart, our five-week programme where we were providing webinars and resources to help you get started. If you weren't able to get involved in those webinars while they were happening, please go to the MyRDA website, so myrda.org.uk, and on the homepage, if you scroll down, you'll get to see the YouTube link, and that will take you to all the webinars that we've had so far, particularly the past five weeks where we've had our road to restart. So welcome today to our webinar. We're focusing on the COVID-19, the medical perspective. My name is Anna Hall and I'm the Director of Operations at RDA and I'm absolutely delighted to, to invite today our guest speaker, Dr Meg Hardman, who is our honorary medical consultant for RDA, so we're delighted to have her, but also chair of the Medical Equestrian Association. Uh, Meg, if you'd like to say a couple of words about yourself, just introduce yourself to everybody on the webinar. Yeah, good evening. Um, thanks for inviting me on this. Um, I, I feel um, I feel slightly uh, terrified by the thought of it. Um, and um, uh, but I think it's quite um, an exciting time. I think it's quite an exciting. It's 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 spring and it feels like there's sort of opportunity. So it's really nice to be involved. Um, I do lots of uh, I'm about to go off tomorrow to do my first horse trials for a long time. So I've got three days at Norton Disney. I do lots of racing. So we've been doing covid secure riding um sort of competitively and, and covering that for the last year so i think it's really nice to see that the rda are, are, are being so proactive um in what you're doing to make it as safe as possible for participants brilliant yeah and it does feel like spring is on its way with the lighter evenings i'm looking out the window normally at seven o'clock in the evening with it being dark and now we've got it nice and light and obviously with uh, hopefully everybody's had a wonderful easter so um, uh, just in terms of people that join this webinar that might not know the format, um, we, I'm going to have a bit of a chat with, with Meg about uh, some of the um, questions that we've had posed to us. But please feel free to ask any questions. So you're all muted and we cannot see you. But if you've got any questions, please go to the bottom of your screen and you'll see a little bubble that says Q&A. Please type your questions in there and we'll come to those once we've posed the questions that we've got pre-prepared. So Meg, my first question for you, now it's a bit of a big question, to be honest, and um, we hear the government talk a lot about what's happening with COVID, with Boris's announcement and Nicola Sturgeon's and all sorts of things. And um, what's your kind of perspective on where we are with COVID-19? Um, I made my daughter look at the stats for this today when we were in the car. <laughs> so um, so, the, so currently the, um, the, the UK um, figure is 39 out of 100,000 per pop, 39 people have COVID out of 100,000 people in the population. So if you th if you think about in sort of middle of January where areas of the country were up to sort of 600 people out of 100,000, that drop is enormous. So it's an absolutely huge dive from, from where we were a couple of months ago. From a, um, from a medical perspective, um, from working, because I work in GP practice and in A&E, the, the numbers just plummeted and it was quite really astonishing. And we went from sort of, um, you know, these person after person coming in in January to, to virtually nothing. And I think it, it almost feels to some people like it's just gone away. Um, and then I think we're a bit surprised when we do see people with COVID, but I think on the whole, it's quite positive. It will definitely get better because the weather's getting better yeah. um, because that's the, the, the nature of viral illnesses. Um, and vaccination rates of 47% of the adult population have been vaccinated, so which is which is really positive. And, and you know, the vaccine appears to be really effective. So hopefully we're going in the right direction. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you very much. So um, we've had a question from a group and it was uh, they had a, a someone who denies the existence of COVID. And I'm sure you probably come across this. So the question is, how should somebody deal with somebody in a group that it might be a parent or it might be a volunteer that is de denying the existence of COVID-19? I think this is a it's a really great question. And I, I work with someone who um, he's, a, he's a doctor and he's not he doesn't practice um and he he basically thinks it's it's all a government conspiracy and and i i think um i think i think you have to deal with it really really quite sensitively because 
for whatever reason that person has got those very strong beliefs and I, I, th I think it's probably not worth trying to change that you're probably not going to change their views so um i think my my feeling is you slightly just have to steer around it i think as long as they are you know adhering to the you know to to rules and um i think you just have to go with it if they're not prepared to wear face masks i think you have to say well you know what what risk are they posing to other people so everyone should be you know in, in normal society we should be hand washing and we should be considering yeah. transmission of illness so um which i think we will do more and more naturally as time goes on anyway so i i, I think i think don't don't get into a row about it don't get into an argument about it you're not going to change that person's mind um and and actually as long as it's not stopping you getting on with what you want to do um steer around it i think there's there's huge amounts of problems with sort of anti-vax campaigns um and i think a lot of it feeds into that and i think you have to kind of live your, live your own life really and let that person get on with it yeah brilliant and but the key thing is making sure that they're following the rules yeah um if they refuse to i guess they're they you that's a separate conversation but not yeah. about their belief system it's actually these are the rules and you just yeah. have to follow them yeah exactly yeah. you know you don't get on a horse without wearing a hat yeah you know you to, <laughs> exactly. and, it, and it's a bit like that you know these are the rules whether you believe in wearing hats or not is is i don't really care the, yeah. that is the rule so you either do it or you don't you don't participate brilliant thank you very much um so uh can i require my volunteers or participants to be vaccinated we've had this quite a lot <laughs> Um, and and it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think um, I think volunteers at um, for RDA actually your your risk of um, of transmission or or becoming unwell from participating in um, riding activities is incredibly low. Um, and um, so so should you make them be vaccinated? I would say you probably shouldn't. Should we all encourage people to be vaccinated? Yes, I think we should. I'm very pro vaccine. The vaccine does give some people side effects, but it's really effective. It's really safe. There's loads of data being gathered about it. I mean, there'll be millions and millions and millions of, of, um, of, of bits of data that are being gathered about it, like any new vaccine. So um, so no, but I think it, it's always worth exploring what, what people's concerns are about, um, about being vaccinated. Um, and some of them are, um, some of them are, again, they're quite difficult to unpick people's belief systems. I, I know quite a lot of doctors that, um, uh, have chosen not to be vaccinated because they've got concerns about effects on fertility and really some quite obscure um, worries. But actually, a lot of them have come round to it to, to some extent from peer pressure as well. And um, it was interesting that lots of um, care home workers had um, declined to be vaccinated. But again, I think it will become one of those things which is just normal. You know, people go and get their flu yeah. vaccines, they'll just get their COVID vaccine. So, um, and, and vaccination works best if most of the population are vaccinated. But if the odd person doesn't, actually in the big scheme of things, it doesn't matter, don't lose sleep over it. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. And also I suppose the thing to remember is even if you have been vaccinated, you still need to socially distance. Yeah. You still should be wearing face coverings if you're coming into close proximity with people. So actually yeah. it shouldn't change people's behaviours whether they're vaccinated or not. Um, the other thing is we have received some legal advice and actually that says you, you, there is no, you can't require volunteers to be vaccinated. You can ask the question of new volunteers when they start out, but you have to be very careful. The other thing that I'd be concerned about for participants is if you ask the question and they're not because of a medical reason and you discriminate against that individual, there could be issues around disability discrimination. So we obviously yeah. don't want to be in that place. So I think that's obviously really good good advice so it's about encouragement isn't it and thinking mm -hmm. about actually how it's going to protect yourself but also protect mm -hmm. others within the group yeah and um, I think your, your point your point on, about um it shouldn't change your behavior that's the most important thing so it shouldn't yeah. change your behavior so and and that's and um, that's quite hard because I see yes. quite a lot of change <laughs> behavior in, in lots of people but um but again just you know and it's about about virus transmission and breaking that chain of virus transmission so um so yeah absolutely don't change what you're doing just because you have been vaccinated yeah I think there is a general temptation having seen my family over Easter for the first time in a very yeah. long time um in a garden I was trying to keep them no you have to be further away from me but there's that temptation always mm. to get that much closer when you know people have been vaccinated so 
it probably is that slight constant drip feed and reminder about making sure that you're socially distancing and that you're following all the kind of requirements of the risk assessment as well. Yeah. And yeah. um, there's been quite a lot of talk about lateral flow testing. So um, uh, do I need to ensure my volunteers or participants have had a lateral flow test? And I've also heard some weird things about stuff in the lateral flow test. People are concerned about that being carcinogenic. I'd heard something weird Ooh. about that, or is that a new one on you? <laughs> oh, that is, a, that is a new one on me. I haven't heard anything about that. So. I think that's a newly um, made up one. I think. Yeah, yeah it's something. I, I've got a secret feeling that someone's making a lot of money out of lateral flow tests because they're just <laughs> everywhere. So there's hundreds of them. And um, I think um, I, the, the problem with lateral flows is that they're not that accurate. So if it's a positive lateral flow, you almost certainly have got COVID. Yeah almost certainly if it's a negative lateral flow you may still have covid right. so i think um i think they can be they can be really useful as a as a as a screening for the well population i think they can be really useful um and the more people that do them the quicker we could potentially avoid new sort of blips um in um in in sort of increases in cases um but i think if you get a positive lateral flow you need to make sure you get a, a pcr test as well um and i mean current you know school advice certainly is if you get a positive lateral flow that means you're then isolated for the next 10 days so there's there's quite big implications to a positive lateral yeah. flow um but yes i think they're there and certainly i would have thought in 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 terms of reassuring um people that are riding or participating in rda hopefully that would be helpful for for people that are, are feeling vulnerable um in and that could be it could feel like a reassuring way to kind of get more people going again yeah brilliant and different countries have slightly different approaches and i can certainly know in england there are community testing stations yeah. and just as an example at lowlands equestrian center our national training center the staff there are doing twice weekly lateral mm. flow testing i think it's at warwick or leamington so the nearest place they're actually doing that again i think that's about customer reassurance mm. and yeah. it's about providing a good customer service so that actually everyone can be confident and feel safe in mm. that environment um, mm. but i think there was also some talk in england about um being able to order some for home as well but i think wales yeah. and scotland and northern ireland have a slightly different approach i think wales is focusing in on certain specific areas where there are high concentrations of cases um, but yeah thank you very much for that so i'm moving on now to hopefully your favorite subject we had a long conversation about face coverings back in last september when you helped uh, develop the rda face covering policy so um what type of face covering should i use is the question oh that's a great question and i think the answer <laughs> is that nobody knows so um so i i think um I, ideally, the disposable medical ones, which are the three layers, they, they would be ideal. There are environmental implications to those. There are cost implications to those. Um, you know, basically, anything is better than nothing. Um, yeah. And as uh, uh, my comment about underwear, don't share it. Um, don't touch it once it's on your face. Make sure it's clean um, and make sure you wash it at the end of the day if it's if it's a reusable. Um, but it probably and, and actually training people to not to touch their face, not wear it below their nose, not wear it under their chin. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, and, the, and there are some people that feel like they can't tolerate them. I've, my, my experience with patients is the people that feel that they can't tolerate them, very often they actually do better than they think they're going to. Um, but it is to some extent training people as well. It's training people to wear them and training, you know, just reminding people. Um, but I think, um, yeah, any, anything is better than nothing at the moment. And I think the evidence is reasonably clear that they are reusable in reducing transmission. Yeah, brilliant. And then uh, moving on to my second face covering question is, when should I use a face covering? So you should use the face covering when you can't socially distance. So, you know, if you're in close proximity with someone who is not in your bubble, then you should use um, then you should use a face covering. Um, I think you shouldn't use a face covering if it's going to impede communication and that's going to be a safety issue. Yeah. Um, and if that's going to reduce the quality of, of the, the communication, um, I think I think it's to getting that balance is quite difficult. You know, that's certainly for people with, um, you know, hearing impairment or who really rely on lip reading. I think you've, you've got to be, you've got to be proactive about, you know, you've got to be sort of, um, uh, you've got to be quite, 
you've got to just be pragmatic about it. Um, but um, yeah, when you you know if you're in if if you're in confined situations, if you're indoors, um, you know if you're if you're in close proximity, put it on. Yeah, and your mention of indoors has made me think of I probably shouldn't <laughs> mention it. <laughs> yeah, don't mention the indoors. Yeah. The hot potato that is indoor arenas, but presumably we all know what an indoor arena is like and how big it is. So yeah. when you're saying indoors, you're meaning actually what? I mean, uh, it, yeah, not yeah. in an indoor arena necessarily. You're talking about in an enclosed space, aren't yeah. you? Really? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So I, I mean, I think, I think, you know, indoor arenas are, are on the whole, they're big and airy, and and I would consider them to be. Well, they're always freezing as well. I'd yes. consider them to be an outdoor space. I know there's been lots of issues about it, but I would consider them to be an outdoor space for the purposes of, of um, transmitting viruses. So, um, yeah. So when, I'm talking about indoors, as in. Yes. Properly. <laughs> Sorry indoors. to bring that up because so, I know that is rather a hot potato at <laughs> yes. the moment. Um, I've got one question that's appeared. So um, let me just move this, have a look. So how can we organise ourselves to allow RDA carriage driving when coach and participant are so close? Um, I'm going to come in quickly on this because um, we do actually have some carriage driving protocols, which we have shared with various governments. And we've been given the green light in England. Um, we're yet to receive the green light in other jurisdictions. So in England, our protocols require both the, so we require the coach in the carriage if they are closer than social distancing will allow which is it pretty much I think every single carriage they have to wear a face covering and that probably is one situation where someone who does need to communicate will have to wear a face covering because they are so close to each other if the driver can wear a face covering that is preferable but we're aware that many drivers won't or can't wear a face covering and um, we also need to make sure we're limiting the time where we come into close proximity so the protocols do talk about um, uh, briefing the driver prior to getting on the carriage where social distancing can be observed so try and give as many instructions as possible before you get on the carriage um, and also make sure you can think about actually how do you support that participant to get onto the carriage and get off the carriage without having lots and lots of people uh, breaching social distancing but I think um, for carriage driving this may be a slower process for us than riding because riding is something that can be done socially distanced um, I don't know whether you've got any thoughts on what I've just very quickly run through in terms of our protocols. Our protocols are available on the My RDA website, Wendy, who posed that question, if you'd like to have a quick look at it. Um, what I'd say is um, just don't forget about hand washing as well. Yes. I mean, you know, I, I, we, we go on and on about face coverings because they're obvious, but actually hand washing in, in that situation is probably the most important thing. So if you're having hands on contact with someone and even if you're yeah. not having hands on contact with someone, you know, frequent, frequent good quality hand washing um, is is probably more important or at least as important. And, and I think we slightly forget about that in the um, in the discussions when we get so preoccupied with the face coverings. Yeah, so hand washing and also um, the protocols do include sanitization of any rains. And if it is a material that soaks in um, the sanitizing material, making sure that dries before we so we've been given advice by the people that make the sanitizing mm. um, material stuff, whatever you call it, gel, I suppose, um, that actually and it's non alcohol based, so it won't uh, deteriorate any leather or any any kind of materials like that. But making sure it's fully dry um, before you get the next participant uh, involved in carriage driving and um, so the next question is face mask can be restrictive for leaders so obviously somebody leading a, a rider um, is wearing a shield as effective as wearing a face mask I've heard a face mask should be worn with a shield to minimize, minimize transmission um, so we um, sort of belt and braces face mask and shield yes is is ideal it's very hard to communicate um, it's very hard to communicate wearing a, a face mask and shield if there's any if either of you have any communication difficulties. Um, so um, shields are not as effective as face masks. Um, they don't they don't reduce virus transmission as much just because they don't catch particles as they come out of your mouth. Um, but again, you have to be pragmatic about it. If that's if that's what allows you to participate um, and get on with you know being involved in sport, then that's what you do. 
Yeah. And so our general advice has been face coverings in preference to, to face shields, as exactly as you say, because they are much more effective. Um, and also when you've got a leader, they're kind of in front. And if the, if the rider sneezed, in effect, it could be catapulted into the shield. I don't know whether that would happen or not, but, <laughs> but it, actually, does. it does. There, there is there are risks with things like that. So actually, mm. our recommendation would be if you if you want to choose one or the other a face covering would be preferable yeah. absolutely yeah, yeah absolutely. um so i've got another question here from kim how will rda introduce changes from the 21st of june if all covid restrictions are removed by government at that time now i have a view on that but i'll let you speak first meg oh no i want to know your view Go on. <laughs> I tell you, I, that's a, that's i think that's a really great question as well um because i think actually that that it so much of that is going to be dependent on people's confidence that levels are very low um, and confidence that it's not going to put very vulnerable people at risk. Um, and I, I, I don't think there's going to be one answer for that. I think there might be lots of different answers but Anna, you tell me what you think. Yeah, so so I guess where I'm at with it is I'm not sure that 21st of June all restrictions will go because the government have said uh, legal gathering limits. So if you think about it, the two metre social distancing isn't written in law. So no one can come up to you and fine you if you're 1.9 metres away from somebody. But they can fine you if you decide to have a rave in a, in a field somewhere. We're like, like probably many of our RDA listeners today would want to have a party in a field. Um, so actually what will happen on the 21st of June is that more people will be allowed to come together. But I still think social distancing, it might not be two metres, it might be closer than that, it might be one metre. And also potentially face coverings in enclosed spaces such as retail might still be required for some time after that. Because both of those are written in guidance rather than in law. So I think that we need to be prepared to live with some of these restrictions for a longer period of time. Mm. And I don't think it will be flicking a switch from lots of restrictions to nothing overnight on the 21st of June. I'm, I'm happy to be wrong. I really am. I'd like to be wrong. But that's, I think, what is what's going to happen. So we'll wait and see um, what happens on the 21st of June. Summer solstice <laughs> for us all to look forward to. Um, I've got a question from oh, an anonymous attendee. Is hand washing using the same bowl of water between multiple participants help against COVID risk? Um, I would say that would be very far from ideal. Yeah. So if you're if you're hand washing, it needs to be clean water. It needs to be clean running water. Um, and um, no, if you if you, sh I mean the so so COVID is is broken down by soap, um, and uh, quite effectively broken down by soap. But it, you need to be washing it off with with clean water, not a bowl. So presumably, I'm thinking about this is probably someone who is a volunteers at an RDA group where there isn't fresh running water. Obviously, that's different places have different facilities. So in that instance, would you recommend hand sanitizer instead? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so the, the, the alcohol based sanitizer. Yeah just using that regularly between participants so when yeah. you're having to touch people just using that much more frequently yeah and absolutely. then probably if you can access hot running water then doing that when uh, you can yeah i mean certainly a, a, you know a racing and eventing where we don't have um we don't have running water they have just vast vast amounts of hand sanitizer and again yeah. using it frequently and and really really rubbing it in really really well so um you know with the our hospital in terms of infection control we're always told that visibly dirty hands you use hot you you should use water um and hands that appear clean you should use alcohol alcohol, alcohol gel so um yeah and you, and again you you do the best with the with what you've got available yeah absolutely and i'm just knowing our horsey world we're not always going to have visibly clean hands are we <laughs> never <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So that's all the questions that I've got from. Oh, hang on. I think there's one coming through. And um, should you change gloves between riders? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, the, I've got um, I think th there's quite a, 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 a quite a few people I've seen over the last year who have worn gloves to go to the supermarket and to go around the place. And actually, it's not a good substitute for um, it's not a good substitute for hand washing. So you're much better um to so even if even if i am using gloves for something and i take the gloves off i will wash my hands so um yeah so if you're if you're using and i'm, I'm assuming the person asking the question is asking about sort of um, rubber gloves but they may be asking about 
gloves that keep your hand yeah. warm um and yeah I, I would i would say you need to change your gloves whatever gloves they are between riders yeah i mean we we have had some discussion about this so it was around uh, when people are breaching social distancing to help somebody mount or dismount so there would actually be physical contact mm. so what we've recommended is not to be wearing if we say riding gloves actually making sure sanitize the hands before they're supporting that individual and once they have then supported that individual sanitizing again now if they need to wear riding gloves because they're leading or they're, they're doing something where actually from a health and safety point of view it's good to wear riding gloves because you could have a lead rope pull out of your hands or anything like that that is okay as long as you don't then touch people with those gloves yeah. so i think that's the key thing actually if you're going to use riding gloves use it for the riding equipment not for the people and clean hands that you sanitize when you're supporting people to to mount or dismount or whatever you need to do so i think that's everything we've got in terms of questions from the floor i've got one final question for you so we've all learned quite a lot in the past 12 months and i'm sure you've probably learned more than most given your profession so what advice would you give to rda groups from what you've learned over the past 12 months in in this world of covid that we're now living in um I think what I've learned is to try try to be tolerant, try to be tolerant of people's um, concerns, their fears, which might seem quite irrational, um, their shortness of temper um, and their impatience with things, because I think there's a lot of um, there's an awful lot of anxiety from lockdown um, and there's an awful lot of anxiety about um, an illness that's still relatively new um, and I have tried my hardest when people are being excessively grumpy and, ex and appearing to be excessively difficult to think actually this is as a result of this year yeah. and so I think I think trying to extend that to each other um, is really important so trying to be tolerant and kind which is not very medical um, <laughs> But, um, you know, and, and I've, I've tried to I've tried to think about that when my patients have been really, really grumpy and difficult, um, that it's it's a, it's it's not maybe not what they set out to do that day. Yeah, no, thank you very much. That's brilliant, because you say it's not very medical, but actually that affects all of us. And that's something that we can all all take on board. And I think everyone has been challenged over the past 12 months mm. and found things difficult and probably haven't always been themselves mm. so actually if people are being tolerant and kind on the receiving end of of you being a little bit off on a particular day i think that that's a really really good piece of advice thank you so much so i think we're coming to the end now um there are no further questions so thank you so much for answering all of those questions so brilliantly and uh, knowing that we've got you on hand to pick your brains about anything medical is absolutely fantastic. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I've got somebody, Felicity, saying thank you very much, Anna and Megan, really, really useful. Uh, Suzanne, so we've got lots and lots of people coming through saying thank you so much for this evening. So that's absolutely oh. brilliant. Um, there is a bit of a gap for people next week. So uh, on the 15th of April um, at 7 p.m., there is a webinar, but it's for Scotland volunteers and participants only, uh, looking at the community and third sector recovery programme. So if you are not in Scotland, you have have a bit of a, a kind of post Easter break from these webinars, but we will be recommencing on the 22nd, I think it is, of uh, April, um, looking forward to a, a next whole series of webinars. So thank you so much for your time, Meg, and uh, hopefully catch up with you soon. Take yeah. care. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Bye bye. Bye.